Hey everybody, welcome. Joe Kim here with Ron Astiani, who is the co-founder of Adam Hawk. And Ron, I, I thought maybe we could start by having you go over your background. We're going to have kind of a free-flowing conversation today about art direction, but it'd be great to just, because you've had such a great ba background, would be great to hear from you, kind of your career up to this point. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's great to, great to be talking to you. I know we've been talking about doing something together for some time now. Um, yeah, I started in the games industry 22 years ago, uh, which makes me feel ancient. Um, and I, I was an artist for sort of the first 10 years. I became an art director. I was head of art uh, for Midway Games here in the UK. Um, and then when Midway kind of went south in 2009, when the, when, uh, the global sort of recession happened, I, I took my sort of creative team and separated off and, and formed Atom Hall. And then that's really where my career got interesting at that point, because before that, I'd been an artist, I'd worked on some cool games. I, I, was, um, I worked on John Carpenter's The Thing, which was a, a, a number one hit game at the time, back in 2002. And then I worked on the Battalion Wars games for Nintendo. So I worked on, on two Nintendo first party titles. Um, and then obviously with Midway, I worked on a number of different Midway games, including Wheelman. Um, but it was only when I went to Atom Hawk and I founded my own studio that, that I sort of got into the sort of really big, you know, big AAA projects, whether it be mobile or film or, or games. So I know the stuff, I, the, probably the biggest things I've worked on, um, I worked on movies wise, uh, Thor 2, um, Guardians of the Galaxy and Avengers 2. Um, and then games wise, you know, I worked on Mortal Kombat 9, Mortal Kombat 10, Mortal Kombat um, uh, 11, uh, and Injustice 1 and 2. Um, I also worked on um, the most recent game that Rocksteady have done, um, Justice League, uh, uh, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Okay. Um, and I've worked on probably 30 different games with Atom. Oh. In, just coming from the perspective of some of the folks in our audience, we've got you know a lot of folks that work in game development. And one of the questions that I've always had is really around the role of an art director, because at different companies, it seems like that role could be different. There's like, and whether it's, you know, the difference between having an art director that's more hands-off versus hands-on and versus one that's, you know, some people call them technical art directors versus other kinds of art directors. So could you kind of break down what is or what should be the role of the art directors and different kinds of art directors there are out yeah, there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky because the games industry, it, you know, you have, you have titles like you have in any other industry, but I don't think there's anywhere where you see such a diverse range of like, you know, an indie studio where you've got three guys working in a bedroom, right up to like a massive studio, like an EA studio, where you've got, you know, two, three thousand you know, people working there. And so as a result, the titles don't always represent what you're going to get, depending on which studio you work in. Um, but definitely, I think, you know, the small scale, and also as well, like as you develop a game, the team scales up. So right. you might start on a team with eight guys on it and end the project with 300 guys on the project. But to start with, you know, usually the art director is quite hands-on. Maybe they're from a concept art background. Maybe they're from a generalist modeling background. But their role is to try and find and identify the style for the project. Uh, you know, what is going to make this project different? And that, that involves taking into account, you know, um, production time scale, you know, you're not going to do something that's hyper real if you've got yeah. a really short production time scale. Um, and likewise, budget and so on. So you have to kind of also cut your cloth, you know, the, the sort of style to, to fit the project. But in bigger studios, I mean, for example, when I was um, studio art director at Midway Games, I was way more of a, a manager. You know, I had like 50 plus artists reporting to me, right. um, multiple different game teams. And my time was probably 20% art, 80% people and budget management. Um, so it, 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 it changes over the life cycle and the scale of the studio. And based upon the different types of roles, do you think that the same person is generally good at all the different, like when you made your shift from being more, you know, hands-on to hands-off and more of a manager, can, do you typically find that the same person can do both of those roles? Uh, well, no, no, it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare, to be honest. And I think that's why you mentioned like technical art directors and yeah. you get art managers as well. And I think what you tend to find is it, it's quite rare that you'll have a studio that will have someone who can both manage and direct and do 
do art and make good art decisions. Right. Um, there's probably 10 guys in the industry I, I know that, that can do that. But a lot of the time, you would take a really good um, artist. You might have, for example, a really good concept artist yeah. who, you, who becomes an art director. Right. And he will always be sort of, uh, he or she will be pace setting from the point of view of making great art and driving the, the quality forward. But you'd need to bolster that person with a really good lead artist or a really good art manager to kind of make sure the managerial side of it is covered. And likewise, you might have a creative artist who's a great concept artist, but they won't know how to actually make something work in game. So then you would have a technical art director who's responsible for implementation. Ron, I wanted to ask you about when you mentioned the role of the art director and you said it was to kind of set the art style. And then we've got these different kind of roles, like a lead art director versus an art, or sorry, a lead artist versus an art director. So kind of the question that I have is, you know, what separates a lead artist from an art director in terms of skill or capability? And when you say that the art director sets the art style, what is that? I, want, I was wondering if you could kind of break that yeah, up a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so, so let me answer the last question first and I'll go back to the lead artist thing. So I think the, the style, the best way to think about it is if you think about the artist Banksy, right? The graffiti artist. Yes. So, so if you think about the, the points of, of style, theme and genre, so his genre is street art. That's what he works in. That's what he does. Yeah. His theme is like those bleak political statements he makes with his work. Right. And his style is the spray painted stencil kind of style where it's black and white. Sometimes he uses a little bit of red, but it has yeah. a very distinct bouncy look to it. And that's, that's what I mean by a style. A style is the way that the art is actually sort of represented, if you know what I mean, the, the colors used, the forms used, the way that things have been sort of tweaked subtly to, to sort of work with that style. Um, and that's, that's the style. Now, the lead artist um, is normally responsible for implementation. So, so you might have a really good art lead who knows how all the tools work, is great at modeling, understands exactly what all the guys should be doing. And the art director is saying, okay, this is what I want the game to look like. This is the vision. And that vision, it's not just about art, it's about communication. So when you think about it, you're, as an art director, you're saying, okay, who's the demographic that is going to be playing this game? What is the device I'm going to play this game on? Like, you know, if it's a PC game, you know, you've got a massive screen, lots of resolution, big powerful graphics card. If it's a mobile device, you've got a small screen and um, not, a lot of, not a lot of horsepower. So you've got to kind of, decide what's going to work on that platform and right. then you've got to communicate with your audience so if you know that your audience is teenage boys for example you, you kind of go with an art style that's going to appeal to teenage boys whereas if you're going for young adults and we see a lot of that with indie games there's a lot of indie game connoisseurs out there who are kind of probably between the age of you know 20 and 50 you know and those guys tend to like something that's a little bit more artistically kind of um interesting I mean, if you look at a game like um, uh, Gris, for example, I was playing Gris with my son uh, a few months ago, and that is a beautiful game. But it's so, it's so, it, you know, it's an artist's game. You know, it, it, it's not, it's not a mainstream game with an art style like that. And so, just like taking my own example, let's say, you know, I've got a studio. We're working on a mobile free-to-play shooter. If you could help me think through like the process. So, as an art director, if you're trying to think of an art style. To your point, you think about the demographic, what they would like, but then do you also consider other factors? Like, for example, there, there are competitive games in the market like yeah, the art style yeah. for PUBG, the art style for Fortnite. They're kind of different. And then how do you, what would be the thought process behind kind of narrowing in on the best style for your game? Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, there's, there's an exercise that needs to happen with the sort of senior team yeah. about what the game is, what the game is, um, who you're trying to sell it to, and all of that, almost like market positioning work, right. and that's not anything to do with art. That's like actually just position in the market. You know, you might have a Venn diagram, uh, you know, sort of, and you would have like, uh, or a four axis diagram where you would have, you know, all the different games that you feel are competing with this and where you yeah. fit in yeah. those axes. Then from there, the art director can go away and say, okay, you know, we are more cartoon point of view, we're more abstract and our games are more fun than say uh, PUBG, right? But we're not as abstract as Fortnite. 
So, so then you kind of look at Fortnite and it's really, really stylized and really cartoony. And then you've got PUBG, which is like really kind of quite realistic. And you're able to say, okay, well, this is roughly where we, we fit both from a theme point of view and also from a style point of view. Right. So, so you sort of almost do a bunch of tasks to kind of work out what, what sort of ballpark you're going to be operating in. And then once you know that, it becomes about gathering references, looking through, you know, other art that's out there, movies, games, you know, it might even be just old school illustration, whatever, whatever reference, you know, the thing with art directors is a lot of it is about finding something that is really obscure, that, that maybe people haven't thought of using in a game before and making it work in a game. Right. Um, you know, if you look at like the, the order, uh, the game, do you remember the order? Is it 18? 1888 or something like that. 1886, I think it is. Right, yeah, yeah. The game of it. But the order, right, it has Victorians and steampunk in the same world. And they've done a very deliberate blend, you know, Victorian sort of era um, history and steampunk. And right. there you go, like the order. And, and that's a lot of the work that art directors do is look through references and go, okay, could I match this up with this? But like another one is like Star Wars, right? So if you think about it, Star Wars takes one of the oldest human stories, you know, that one person will rise up and sort of sacrifice themselves and save us all. It's, it's in lots of different religions, lots of different movies. And um, they take that and they mix it with the space race, um, which at the time, you know, Star Wars was filmed in 1977. So it was only, you know, 10 years or so after man, man first walked on the moon. Um, and then also themes from World War II, because you have to bear in mind 1977, was still fairly close, like in living memory for of World War II. So they have this kind of like fascist regime and like, you know, guys walking around in very smart uniforms, not, not massively far away from, you know, Nazi Germany. Right. Um, and they mash up all of these themes. And because they're so current in the, the public's eye at that point, it really tugs on people's sort of like uh, sensitivities and becomes very popular. And that's, that's what I mean as well by demographic is, as an art director, you look at what the people you are going to sell this product to are into, and then you kind of find themes within that sort of culture and then right. kind of construct something out of that. Yeah, I hope you, that makes sense. It's complicated. Yeah, no, it actually, <laughs> the way you're talking, it kind of reminds me of the Hollywood concept of the strange attractor, taking something that you know and something unique and kind of blending yeah. the two. But. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I do think as well, like the general consumer while they might say they like they want to see something truly different yeah usually in history whether in movies or games or anything when something is truly different and truly unique people will um, actually say later on oh, it was ahead of its time meaning it was ahead of its time meaning actually it was a really good idea but at the time nobody got it yeah. and that's the problem with doing stuff that is truly unique is quite often uh, while it might be critically acclaimed it commercially isn't always a big success and i think that's something as an art director you, you've got to be a bit careful of because it, it's very easy as an artist to say oh i want to produce something that's truly unique but at the end of the day we're making a commercial product right and it's not always you know save it for your own work basically i think the truth is you've got to you've got to make something that's going to be commercially viable and the other question i want to ask you is as an art director communicating to your art team now i've had the experience of working with a lot of different art studios and it seems like the documents to communicate the vision are similar but at the same time different so there's some concept generally of like maybe a mood board or an art bible but there, there's several docs that it didn't at least from my personal experience haven't been like completely standardized but are similar and so i wanted to ask you in your experience if you were to recommend the kinds of documents or the way to communicate that art style and vision to the rest of the team, what would you recommend? How would you actually, I don't know if you have any specific examples yeah. of docs that you would recommend. I think, I think each art director has their, own, has their own process, but over time, there is starting to become like a kind of industry standard, just purely through the fact that there's a, an expectation from okay. everybody else how something should work. And that is actually one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is trying to sort of educate and kind of work with people to try and create some standardization. Um, I think also a lot of it depends on whether you're working on new IP or existing IP. Okay. Because if, if you're an art director and you get a role on a really big franchise, it's maybe seven or eight versions in, um, 
you're really a custodian of that IP and you're not going to do any really big changes. You're really going to tweak it 10% and that's going to be the next version. And it's always a massive frustration point for a lot of ADs who get sort of brought in and they're told, you know, you're going to work on the next whatever big franchise, the next version of it. And they come in and they go, yeah, I'm going to really put my stamp on this. It's going to be all, you know, a new thing. And then they find out the studio wants to just do a 10%, you know, in, increment because it's such a big money spinning IP that they don't want to mess, mess about with it. If the recipe works and great. So in, in those cases, what you tend to find is the art documentation is much about this is what this IP is about. And these are all the past versions of this IP. And this is say this character and what, how they're represented on mobile. And this is how this character is represented on PC. And then, and then what you're going to do to take it that extra 10% in the direction of the new game. Um, and that's quite a kind of a, uh, it's actually a lot harder than you think because, because you're, you're dealing with all of this legacy sort of visual that you can't mess with. Um, uh, I mean, actually, if you think about it, do you remember uh, Ninja Theory did a Devil May Cry game? Um, so the Devil May Cry series was always this kind of very gothic, very Japanese kind of theme to it. And then it was given to a Western developer and they did a completely different take on Devil May Cry. And I thought it was awesome, but the fans were completely polarized. Like some of them loved it. Some of them venomously hated it. And the game got a real, you know, a real rough ride in the reviews because of this big departure from expectation. Um, so to go back to your point about, about art bibles, I think for a new IP, um, it goes through different stages. So your first iteration of your art bible isn't really a bible, it's a style pitch. And that style pitch will be like maybe 20 pages long, maybe 30 pages long, and it will be all of these references that the art directors found and how you're going to blend them together and represent them. And that's then pitched to the other executives in the group. Um, if everybody else is happy, the design, the production and so on, then you would pitch it to the rest of the art team and you can start working on concept. Once you, once you produce some early stage concept, then you can start to turn it into a Bible because you start to understand what, what works and what doesn't work out of those references. And at every stage, really, that art Bible should be a, a living, breathing document. You know, it, it never really stops being updated. And every time you discover something new on the process of making the game, you should really try and document it because it, it's a pain when you get to the end of a game and you haven't documented anything and it's successful. And right. someone says, hey, can you make another one? And you're like, oh, <laughs> didn't write any of it down. Right. The other question, so, you know, you, you were, you, you created Adam Hawk. And so I would imagine you have a lot of experience working with studios, both like, you know, internal versus external. And that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. If you were to give advice to a game studio trying to think about internal versus external art teams, like how would you advise those companies to think about how much is internal, how much is external, and how to think through that, that balance? Yeah, I mean, there isn't really a, a limit on how much is internal versus external, but there is a balance of, it's almost like a balance of trust okay. and expectations. So for example, if, if you are working in a studio where you have a very, like an established IP, mm -hmm. there's loads and loads of rules about what can and can't happen with that IP. So I'm going to use Harry Potter as an example, because I worked on, on a number of Harry Potter based projects over the years. Um, you need to have that written down because you can't expect an external person to know what your internal team knows. And a lot of that knowledge is, is almost like, uh, it, you know, it's almost held in the culture of the studio. Uh, so you have to kind of find a way to write it down. And if you can't write it down, then you've really just got to understand that the, the external people are going to ask a lot of questions and they're going to make a lot of dead end turns while you explain it to them. Um, however, you can also take an existing IP. Like when I worked on Guardians of the Galaxy, Marvel said, do whatever you like. This is, we're gonna, this is a complete reboot. We have no expectation of what this is gonna be. And so from that point of view, while they've done some comics, all through the history of Marvel, they've had Guardians of the Galaxy comics, the movie was a complete blank canvas. And, and so that's trust, you see with that, that's guys, you know, you're the artist, you show us what this looks like. And, and, and that was great, that was super liberating to do that. And the worst type of project is when the client sort of doesn't know what they want. They don't have any documentation. 
and yet <laughs> they want you to do it all that doesn't work you know you, you have one thing or the other and you can't you can't expect it all oh and speaking of those worst kind of projects i, I was Hoping you could talk to us also about just maybe some of the lessons learned or some of the biggest mistakes in terms of like when you're working with either a, a game studio separately or some of the mistakes you've seen uh, at game studios with, with respect to the art and the art teams. Yeah, I think, I think, I think there's a number of things. There's, there's obviously a lot of process stuff and process is like the, the challenge I think is that it's really understanding that if you're going to get somebody to do something externally for you on a fixed price. So say, for example, you know, you say, I want a character, a piece of character I'm doing, and the artist says 10 days uh, with the work. And then you get six days through the work and you kind of go, actually, I want to change something right at the beginning of the process. That, that, that doesn't work that way. And, and if, if you, as a client, if you don't have a fixed process and you think you're going to be changing your mind a lot, it can be better to just say, we'll take your time on a retainer and we won't, you know, we're not going to agree the scope of the work. We're just going to say, look, come and do some concept art for us. We'll pay for a month of your time and we'll just explore lots of different things with you. Right. Um, so that, that's the kind of process challenges that was had. The other thing with process is always feedback and being accurate with feedback. Like it doesn't sort of work saying to somebody external, oh, we, we don't really like the character. We think it's not quite on target and then yeah. not explaining what I'm, it is i'm definitely guilty of that yeah you know <laughs> like um, can you make this cooler and they're like what the yeah, hell does that yeah, mean make, make cooler you know it's like having a keyboard with just make cooler button on it, it it's it doesn't you know it, it doesn't work that way you have to be able to explain okay. in detail yeah. what it is you want or if you can't explain in detail just be prepared to say okay this isn't what i want can you show me five more different ideas and i'm prepared right. to pay for it because that's the that's the other option is you just say keep shooting things at me until I see what I like, um, but the problem with that is that's a very expensive way to do things. But you'd be surprised how many studios do that. I mean, I've I've worked on a number of particularly really big IPs where they're trying to find a new direction for it, and they might even engage with several studios. I mean, there were, there there was a game uh, Rise Son of Rome. Uh, do you remember that back on Xbox and? And yeah. um, they engaged with Atom Walk, they engaged with two other external studios, and we all had a go. We all did our own take on this, and they took the best bits from each of them. And that was a really cool way of doing it. I mean, it was expensive, but it was, it was a good way of doing it. Um, and I think, um, I think the, the, from a creative point of view, I think it, it is, again, like it's knowing how much room to give the artist to, to use their own minds, because if you start just telling people externally exactly what you want from the beginning, you're kind of like leveraging everything you know in your head, but you're not utilizing their creative ability as well. Right. So I, I tend to like, when I art direct, I always sort of define a box and I say, this is the boundary of what I want. You know, you can't go here and you can't go here, but everything in the middle here is totally free for exploration. So you show me what would be a really cool idea in this space. And by doing that, particularly when the more artists you have, the more brains you have, you know, by doing that, you kind of get a lot of different ideas generated and you're able to kind of cross pollinate those ideas. And, you know, it's, it's definitely the best way to do it. Now, can that go too far? Like one of the things I joke with a lot of people is that everyone thinks they're an art director. So like the CEO says, oh, it should be like this. And then the lead product manager might say this and everyone's got their opinion. So then how do you, you know, how do you manage all of the different opinions that everyone has? Because everyone thinks they know best. Someone always has to own the art process. I so, so one of my points, and I've had a few jobs like this where I've gone in as an AD and I found out that everybody has got an opinion. <laughs> right. And I've had to kind of politely just say, look, yeah. I appreciate your opinion and I'm going to listen to it. But at the end of the day, it's Michael, right. I'm the art director. And, and I think that's how it has to be. And I think um, the worst thing as an external is when you're dealing with a, an internal team that has that kind of like lots of feedback, lots of opinions going on, and they haven't been able to sort of create that buck stops here kind of role. Right. And as an external vendor, you just get unfiltered feedback from loads of different people. That is, a, that is possibly one of the worst situations because you, you don't want to be rude and say, guys, can you just get your, <laughs> yeah, get get your, your get it together? <laughs> give, me, give me the feedback. 
But at the same time, you kind of know exactly what's going wrong and you're like, oh, I have no, as an external, one of the biggest problems is you never have control sort of politically over what's going on inside the client studio. So you always have to, even though you can see sometimes a car crash is going to happen, you kind of have to sort of be polite about it the whole way and, and try your best, you know, to persuade them to see it your way rather than being able to dictate it. Oh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned you've worked on mobile console film. And so, especially in terms of like the, the different game platforms between mobile and PC or console, can you talk about when you're thinking about whether it's the art style or how, the, the spec how you would create art for the different platforms, what are some of the differences? What do you have to, what do you keep in mind as an art director? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the process is pretty much the same between the okay. platforms. So the process of art directing and creation and creating the style is the same. But, but the things you look at in that style are different. So, you know, with a mobile device, you've got fairly small screen real estate, um, which is made more complicated by the fact that someone could also play a mobile game on a tablet device. And that is something that is becoming more and more difficult to deal with because, you know, you've got a really small screen and then someone plays it on an iPad Pro and they've got a really high res screen and loads okay. of power. So, so there's that challenge, but that aside, on a mobile device, generally you've got small screen real estate. It's not so much about pixel resolution because you've got a very high resolution screen, but just the size of it, if you have things on screen that are too small or too detailed, they get lost in that small screen and you end up with people sort of you know, scrutinizing the screen very carefully right. to see what's happening. The other thing as well about mobile is still a lot of mobile games rely on putting the controls on the screen. So where with a PC game, there are virtually, you know, there's UI elements around the screen, right. but there's no controls on the screen. Right. With mobile, you might have, you know, controls on the screen as well. So you, you can't put anything in those spaces. Um, so, you know, there's that. And then the other thing with mobile games is they tend to be, from an experience point of view, quite a pick up and put down, fast turnaround kind of gameplay. So again, you know, from a readability point of view, the game has to be very clear. And that's why you tend to find a lot of mobile games have very crisp graphics, very sort of, um, you know, clear colors, uh, lots of like simplified forms, just purely because it, it tends to work best. Um, then when you go through console, I mean, console is, console and PC are a very different market because you've got indie at one end and you can end up with games on PC that are almost mobile looking games, right up to like massive blockbusters like, you know, the, battle, the last Battlefield game was possibly one of the most detailed games I've seen, you know. Um, and you can do that with a PC. You've got huge graphics cards, massive screens, all the controls are not on the screen, um, quite simple to deal with. Um, so you've got to kind of, yeah, you've got to choose, you know, work to your platform. Um, the other thing as well about, about I think, um, now that we're getting into VR as well, we're ending up with, with challenges around where we put UI and where we put data. So, so like in a, in a PC game, you, it's totally fine to put 2D graphics on the screen and that works. Whereas with VR, if somebody is in 3D space and they're looking at something in the distance, and if you put the UI here, essentially in, in their space, they're looking into the distance and then they're having to look really close to them at, that, at how much ammo they've got. And it's really kind of confusing, the depth perception. So, you know, everything is opening up now, depending on, you know, you've got mobile, console, PC, and then you've got, is it VR? Is it AR? And all of these things have to be considered when, you, when you're picking a style. I, the, one other question I want to ask you about is, what is, your, what is your opinion on concept testing? So, like, if you were... From an art director's perspective, you know, one of the things a lot of product managers like to do is just run a bunch of tests. And so, like, let's say you come up with three different art styles for a, a new game concept of some kind. Do you have any thoughts in terms of, like, if the testing showed one art style is superior, but you felt very strongly about another, how would you, how do you think about that kind of stuff? I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it depending on what the product is. So I think if you're doing a free to play mobile game, the, the problem with free to play is you have to capture that, that, that user in that first few seconds. Okay. And it is so like, you know, polarizing. Whereas with a, with a premium game where someone paid money for it, 
you already have them. They've already paid 10 bucks for this, or they paid 20 bucks for this. And even if when they first fire the game up, they go, oh, I'm not sure about this art style, they're going to persevere with it. And what you also tend to find with, particularly with quite out there art styles, is people's first reaction is, well, I'm not sure whether I like this or not. And then once they get used to the experience, they start to go, yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can feel, I feel that I am enjoying this. And, and that's kind of a thing. So unfortunately, with free to play, you don't have the, the luxury of a captive audience. You have, to, you have to design something that is going to capture people day one. Yeah. Um, so I, I think A-B testing and things like that are perfectly good on, on that space. But it's a shame as well, because I think as an art director, you, you, you always want the, the, the art that you produce to come from inside, and you don't want it to be like a commercial decision. But at the end of the day, it is a commercial decision, because it's tough, you know. Ron, I wanted to now ask you about kind of development in terms of like, you're an art director, let's say you have a, a small internal art team. How much of the role of improving the art skills of the team and even as an art director how do you think about how how would an art director improve as an art director how do you build additional skills how do you get better at your craft for both yourself and then in terms of training the team and is it the role of the art director to train the team or is yeah. it okay it totally is it totally is you know i've worked with some really tricky ad's over the years who've sort of said well that's not my problem and you know if this guy can't do the work i'm asking him to do then it's his problem and I think that's a very, that's a very hard line rule, rule to take. I think the truth of it is, is nobody comes to work with the intention of doing a bad job. Right. And, you know, I think as long as you appreciate that as a manager, yeah. then you're able to say, okay, on this instance, they didn't hit the mark, but what can we do to get them there? And I think obviously there are times when someone repeatedly doesn't hit the mark. Yeah. And if there's nothing actually wrong, like, you know, if it's a case of they're working really hard, they're doing all the learning they can, but they just can't hit the mark. Then unfortunately, yes, you, you've probably done everything you can and, and it's time to make a, a tough decision. But usually if you're able to show um, the artist where they went wrong, and the other great thing about managing artists is funny, like, like if you talk to um, managers who are not creative sort of art background managers, they'll always say, oh, I hate managing artists. Artists are the worst people to manage. From my point of view, artists are the easiest people to manage because all they really care about is making great art. Right. And if you can show them how you could, how they could have done it better, they will nearly always be like, thank you so much, this is awesome, and they'll just try and smash it the next time around. So I think, I think it is like you need, I think as a manager of artists, you need to be able to give them that feedback that actually helps them improve their work. And if you can't do that, then, I, then that's where the problem comes in because if you're not able to give them good feedback, they get they get hacked off, you get hacked off, and it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. And then, um, as the art director yourself, how do you, if not not having anyone above you to give you feedback on your art or what you're doing, how do you improve as an art director? Just got to work hard, work hard, read a lot of books. I mean, the the, the key attributes that I always say make a good art director are just a hunger and curiosity for everything around them. Like, you know, like I love traveling, I read tons of books, I look at tons of photographs, I spend hours looking at art stations, feeling incredibly jealous at how awesome some of the other artists are out there and how my work is terrible. You know, like that, that kind of like, you know, that humble kind of approach where when you see something that's amazing, it's amazing, like take it in, you know, take it in, understand what they did that makes it so awesome, try and, try and dissect it, you know. I think, I think also being an art director and being an artist in general, it's, it's a lifetime of learning. Um, you know, it is like nobody finishes the, the training as an artist. You, you, you're an artist till the day you die and you learn something every day, hopefully, because you've got an open mind, you know. Ron, I have one last question, and this is really around processes and tools. I was wondering if you could talk about whether it's for art reviews or just the general processes that you think are important for an art director to have with their team? And then what are some of the tools that you use for whether it's art, whether it's Basecamp or Asana or, you know, what are some of the tools that art directors should be looking at for some of those processes? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of great tools out there. And, and that's, that's, I mean, when I started at Atomborg, none of these tools really existed. Like in 2009, we were doing all the feedback through email. <laughs> and it was awful. I, you know, you would lose things and all sorts of stuff. But luckily, you know, a lot of uh, sort of co-collaboration tools have come a long way since then. 
Um, I think that when you're in a studio and you have the team with you, it's really important to get everybody together to do a, like a kind of art review at least once a week, okay. um, if not more often. And there's a few reasons for that. One is when everybody can see the whole direction of the product, then they start to understand how their work fits into the big picture. And one of the habits, the bad habits that a lot of artists have is they start to just focus on their bit. And when they just focus on their bit, their ability to sort of function and interact with everybody else's work starts to go out the window. So by drawing everybody in and saying, okay, guys, these are all the different pieces of the game we're making and you all need to look at what everyone else is doing. There's that immediate kind of connection point. The other thing as well is it, it, it saves the art director some time. So if you imagine that you have to say the same piece of feedback 20 times to each individual artist, oh, yeah. if you just get everyone in a room, everyone hears what was said to everybody else and that works really well. Um, and the other thing is it just builds a bit of team, team morale to do it that way. And you can celebrate the wins as well. When someone does some really good work, you can celebrate them in front of everybody else and, and they feel like they get a really good boost from that. And everybody else sort of sees what, what got um, them that praise. And it becomes like a little bit of a, a feedback loop where, you know, good, good behaviors are encouraged and bad behaviors are discouraged. Um, but then when you're working externally, that is, that's really hard. And I think, I think one thing is, again, try and do a weekly or, or a daily anyway, just through Teams or whatever tool you're using for video conferencing. Um, but feedback wise, my, my favorite tool is still Basecamp, okay. just because I find that a lot of artists um, struggle with more complex tools. But the problem with the problem with artists is you've got such a range of technical proficiency. So you could have one guy who's like a power user and he's using lots of different 3D tools and lots of different systems and he's going to have no issue with, with using a feedback tool. And then you could have another artist who is painting things by hand, you know, with, with acrylics or whatever and scanning it in. And, and why you try and harmonize all of these processes you are going to have different artists working in different mediums with different technical abilities. So I, I like Basecamp because I've not come across an artist yet who's gone, I don't get it. I can't use it. Um, but I also, you know, I've used Shotgun before. That's pretty good as well. Um, it, it's like 10 times the price of Basecamp though. So I use Basecamp. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Basecamp going to have to pay me a commission now. <laughs> Ron, I want to, Thank you for your time. But also before we end, Ron, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to now? And you've got a book coming up. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit yeah, about thanks. the book. Yeah, so obviously I, I ran out and walk for um, 10 years and I exited um, was it last April. So last April I left, we had a new, new baby boy, my third child. He's eight years younger than the next one. So I'm gonna be a pretty old dad by the time he's 18. But, you know, I took that opportunity. I thought, look, I've, I've sold the studio. I've run it for years. There are some other things I want to do with my life. And I've always been really passionate about education. You know, even when I was running out of work, I was talking a lot at events, and doing things for universities. So and a lot of these talks I do, I had people coming up to me afterwards and saying, do you have further reading? Is there any, are there any videos that, that I could watch? And there isn't anything on Art Direction out there. It's amazing, uh, particularly in games. So, so I decided to write a book. So ArtStation are going to be publishing um, a book called The Art of Direction, um, which should be out, I think, early next year. And um, that is, it's a deep dive you know, into every subject. And if you're aspiring art director or you're already an art director, then it should be a really good, uh, a good reference point. Okay, awesome. I'm definitely going to be buying that book myself. And maybe we can end, do you have one last bit of advice for any, whether it's a studio or art directors out there? I think, I think, I mean, there's so many good, good pieces of, of good to know knowledge. And I think, I think like, I think a lot of it is, is I think one of the things is for studios is to understand that, that finding a style takes time. This right. is something I've seen a lot, uh, a lot of studios do where they, they get an art director in and they're like, right. So by the end of the first month, you're going to have the style, right? No, nope. that's like saying to an author, by the end of the first month, you're going to have written the book. No, you're not. You're going to have started it. And, it, and it's, a, it's a process of increasing resolution. So what happens is you, you create a vision and it's very loose. And then over time, all of the different pieces gain more and more resolution, more definition as to how it looks. A little bit like a video game. You think about it with a game, 
you normally do broad brush strokes of what the game is going to be, what the gameplay could be. And then as you polish it, things get, get more clear. And I guess that's one of them is, is to understand that. And I think the other thing from an art director's point of view is, um, is I think a lot of ADs get too hung up in the early stages of to what, what they feel can be achieved with the tech. And I, I tend to think that come up with what you think is going to be awesome and then go and talk to the technical director and see what he can do with it. Because uh, <laughs> I think a lot of the technical directors really like the challenge. I mean, I worked with a really great technical director a while back and she, uh, she, she just took, you know, I showed her what we wanted to do and she was like, wow, this is going to be really hard. Uh, I'm not sure about it. And then a couple of weeks come by and she's like, yeah, yeah, maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that. So, you know, you've got to kind of, you've got to aim high if you want to even get halfway there, you know? Right. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time, Ron. Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give the video a like. For more videos about game development, the free-to-play games industry, and the business side of games, feel free to subscribe. Click on the bell notification so you don't miss a new video. And otherwise, hope you have a good day. Check out the next video. Bye.